So how y'all doing? Survived the rain. It's still uh, thundering a little bit. Hear it? That's all right. Uh, that is evidence that God is here. Um, so a pig and a chicken are walking down the street, and they pass by a church, and the church sign is promoting a Saturday morning men's bacon and egg breakfast. And the chicken leans over to the pig and says, hey, we should serve at that event. And the pig said, I don't know. I mean, for you, it's just serving. For me, it's kind of a sacrifice. <laughs> Think about that. We're talking about a topic today that is uncomfortable sometimes, that can feel like a real sacrifice. We're talking about generosity, not just generosity with money, but generosity with time and energy and talents. But uh, we're going to kind of wind up our series today. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Matthew 25. We're wrapping up today our Beyond Belief sermon series where we are going back to the basics of what it means to be a disciple. And as we've said a bunch over the last few weeks, and we've talked about this big word, sanctification, sanctification is a word that means the process of becoming a disciple. It comes from the Greek word hagiosmos, which means to be set apart for special use, and that's exactly what we are as Christians. We've been set apart by God for a special purpose. And so the way we've been saying this for several weeks now is that sanctification is the process of moving from being decided to disciple. And so what that looks like is some of you guys made a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe that was a few months ago. Maybe that was many years ago. But you kind of got stuck. You've never really moved forward from there. You've never become discipled. And the reality is if we are true followers of Jesus, over time we should start to act more like Jesus. We should start to talk more like Jesus. We should even start to think more like Jesus. And we said over and over that there aren't a magic formula for how to become discipled, but there are five basic things that we see that Jesus talked about and the writers of the New Testament write about that seem to be fundamental for moving from decided to discipled. And so we've been talking about those each week, and these, these, the list of these five things are uh, consistent prayer, generosity with time and talents, generosity with resources, making and growing disciples, and Bible knowledge. And today we're really focusing in on generosity, both with time and talents, and also with resources. The passage of Scripture we're looking at today is from one of Jesus' most famous teachings in the Bible. It's called the Olivet Discourse. And it is where Jesus was teaching really about the end of time. And it has the very deep theological title of Olivet Discourse because well, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives when he taught, so it became the Olivet Discourse. And so Jesus tells his followers a series of parables or stories about what it looks like to prepare for his return and how to be part of what he calls the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God until he returns. And if you remember, a parable is a made-up story, but it has an important Bible truth or theological truth. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about one of these parables, the parable of the, the ten bridesmaids. And we're talking about another one of those parables today. It's the parable of the talents or the ten bags of gold. Look at Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So Jesus is setting this up here. Jesus is the, the master who's going on a journey. And the, the people that were listening to him would have known exactly what he meant when he said a journey because travel back then was very different than today. It was very slow. You couldn't jump in a car. So it took weeks, and people would be gone for months, sometimes even years. And you didn't know when they'd get back because there were no cell phones. There was no email. People weren't checking in to let you know they were getting off the boat in Cozumel, so you knew right where they are. So they would have expected the master to leave and then coming back unexpectedly. Look at verse 15. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one one bag, each according to his ability then he went on his journey. To understand this parable, you need to realize that the master doesn't give everybody the same amount of money. He gives them different amounts of money. It also doesn't say that he sat down and explained his rationale to the servants, that he explained to them why this one's getting five and this one's getting two and this one's only getting one. It says that the master decided to entrust them with his money based on what he perceived their abilities to be. And so that's how he divides it up. Let's keep going. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned 
and settled accounts with them. So what you see here is the first guy, he's got five bags of gold, and he runs off and invests it for his master. The, the second guy has two bags of gold, and he runs off and invests that. But the third guy is a little afraid. He's worried about what might happen. So he goes and he digs a hole and he puts the the bag of gold in the ground. And and it says that the master was gone a long time. And if you think about it, that makes sense for them. And it will then play into how this parable applies to us today is I'm sure at some point the servant started to go, maybe maybe he's not coming back at all. Maybe, Maybe this is just, maybe we can do whatever we want with this money. Maybe, Maybe it's like our money at this point. But then it says that the master returns unexpectedly, and there's an accounting. So you folks in business and and, and, in finance, you know what that means. There's an audit. Somebody is going to look at what was done with the master's money. And the reality is, when you hear the master come through the gate, after he's been gone a long time, you're either going to be really excited, or you're going to be really nervous. And it just depends on whether or not you're ready. All right, let's keep going. Verse 20 through 23. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more, doubled his money. The the master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So I want you to see here that the one guy comes back with five bags of gold. He's doubled that, and he's now got ten. The other guy comes back with four, but the master treats them exactly the same way. He says the exact same thing to them, despite the fact that we're talking about different amounts of money. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've done well with little things. I'm going to put you in charge of more things. Come and share your master's happiness. And the point that Jesus is making here is it isn't about what they had. It's about what they did with what they had. Does that make sense? All right, let's keep going. Verses 24 through 28. The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, look, I I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bags of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. So this last servant, he gets really scared about the money. He's worried about his master, and so he just goes out and buries it. And, and I think we do that too. We, we let our financial decisions be driven by fear and worry. That's what he does. But it, to understand this parable, you've got to really understand the fact that he gives the master back all his money. He didn't steal anything. He didn't go out and blow it on expensive dinners or, you know, putt-putt golf at that new place that's really expensive or, or creamistry ice cream, things I might have done. He didn't do any of that. He says, here's your money back. And the master says something that kind of catches you off guard. I mean, he calls him lazy and wicked. That seems a little over the top because the guy didn't steal the money. He, I mean, maybe it was a, t- a teaching opportunity in that moment or it was a, a coaching experience that he should have said, come on, man, let's do a little better. Think about this differently. But it, he doesn't. And, and I think that when you think about it, you, the guy could say, look, I, I didn't do anything. And, and that might be the point that Jesus is making. He, he didn't do anything. He didn't handle the the master's money well. Now listen to how Jesus explains this parable in the last verses 29 through 30. He says, for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's tough. Some tough teaching here by Jesus. And, And what I think Jesus is doing is he's trying to get us ready for his return. He wants to kind of shock us a little bit, kind of get our attention so that we prepare ourselves for his return. And and we need to understand that this parable is about a lot more than money. It's about time and energy and priorities. But I think Jesus really uses money here because he knows how difficult money is for us. When we make this journey from decided to discipled, money is one of those things that we really hold on to and we have a hard time letting go of back to God. 
But God knows that if we can let go of that, if we can learn to be generous back to him, and we can rethink how we view our finances, that it will dramatically impact our relationship with him and help us make the journey from decided to disciple. In other words, it's not about what we have. It's about what we do with what we have. All right, look back a little deeper at verse 14. We're going to look at that a little more. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. That is such an important word to understand the meaning of this parable. These servants, it wasn't their money. It wasn't money that was given to them by the master to do with whatever they wanted. They were entrusted with a certain amount of the master's money to follow his will and to invest it the way he would want them to invest it. And the reality is we've all been entrusted with different amounts of money, just like these three servants. Some of you have been given five bags of gold. Some of you have been given two bags of gold. Some of you have only been given one bag of gold. Some of you might say you were left holding the bag and that's all you have. But the point of this is we're all in this together because no matter whether it's five bags, two bags, one bag, or whatever, it's not our money. Right? None of it belongs to us. The Bible is very specific about that. This parable is very specific. But let's look at a couple of verses that make this very clear. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So everything belongs to God. But maybe you're thinking, well, that doesn't apply specifically to money. How about this one? Haggai 2, 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. God makes it very clear in the Bible that he owns everything. Every bit of our talent, every bit of our time, every bit of our resources, he owns all of it. He just entrusts it to let us use it for a little while. And if we understand this issue of ownership, that it doesn't belong to us, man, it makes discussions about generosity so much easier. Like, it makes perfect sense to talk about money in church if it's God's money. But if you view it as your money, then I can understand why you would probably not like to hear talk about money in church because you're like, why does, why does this preacher tell me what to do with my money? And, and it all comes down to this issue of ownership. But if those passages of Scripture weren't specific enough or direct enough or harsh enough, look at this one with me. This is Malachi 3.8. This is God talking here, and he says, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. That's tough. God is saying if you withhold generosity from him, that it's stealing. And that doesn't seem right. I mean, look, if I'm not generous, call me greedy. I mean, but don't call me a thief. But when you really understand this issue of ownership, it makes a lot more sense. Because God's saying it's mine. So think about it this way. Several months ago, somebody gave me $200 in gift cards, and they said, I want you to bless somebody in need with that. So I, I took it, and that happens pretty regularly for me. Somebody will walk up and just say, I want to you know, bless somebody else. Will you do that for me? So just imagine that I had those $200 worth of gift cards for something in need, and I went, you know who has a need? That's me. I need some cowboy tickets. I'm going to go buy me some Dallas cowboy tickets. And I go buy Dallas cowboy tickets with that $200. Would you call me selfish? Or would you call me a thief? You'd call me a thief, right? Because I was not given that money to do whatever I wanted to. I was given that money for a specific purpose. God entrusts his resources to us so we can be generous back to him and show our love for him, but, but also so we can be generous with others. In, in this parable of the bags of gold, we see that the master is entrusting wealth to his servants. But he's entrusting it to invest it how the master would want, to do his will with that, those investments. And that's what they go out and do. And, and so I want you to listen to what our master, what God wants us to do with our wealth in this life. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. In other words, God is saying, I want you to be generous back to me so you can prepare yourself for my return, for the next life. The master wants us to be generous with his money. And then when the master returns, we're going to give an accounting for how we use his resources. And the reason this parable is so appropriate is because Jesus has been gone a long time. 
It's been 2,000 years now, and so I think it's easy to go, well, maybe, it's, maybe it's really just mine. Maybe it's my money at this point. But he's reminding us that he will return. And, and when the master comes through the gate, we're either going to be really excited or we're going to be really nervous, depending on whether we're ready for his return. And, and there's a couple of mistakes I think you can make when you hear a scripture like this. The, the first thing that you can go is, well, Nathan picked... Now, there's probably one or two more passages of Scripture about money, and he just picked one of those and went with that. But I'm sure that's not throughout the Bible. Boy, would you be wrong. The Bible talks a lot about money. In fact, Jesus talks a lot about wealth and money. Almost half his parables were about wealth or possessions. Jesus talks more about generosity than he talks about prayer. He talks more about money than he does faith. And, and I think he does that. Because he knows the connection that our money has to our spiritual connection to him. If we can change the way we view money and we can be generous the way God's calling to us, it will begin that sanctification process at such a higher speed. But what you're going to see as we go through this sermon is it can also change your mental and physical health. Here's the second mistake that I think you can make when you hear Scripture like this about, you know, command those who are wealthy is to go, well, I'm out. That's not me. I, that's not even talking to me. You'd be wrong about that. We are some of the wealthiest people in the world. If you have an apartment, an old beat-up car, you have way more wealth than people around the world. And, and, and I think sometimes we forget that. But it, you, you got to remember in this, it's, it's not about what we have. It's about what we do with what we have. So quite a few years ago, my family went on a mission trip to Uganda, Africa, and we went over there to teach a, a children's conference. But the coolest thing that we did is we traveled around for a couple of days and went to some of the parents' homes. Now, I'm going to use home very loosely because we would drive up into the mountains and then we'd walk down these dirt paths and we'd get to this little wood and mud shack with no windows or doors. About the, most of them were about the size of this little teaching stage right here. And they would literally have to take their mats that they slept on and put them up on top of the roof every day so that they could actually have room to sit in their house. And, and they would cook outside because there was no place to cook in their house. And, and sometimes they didn't have anything to cook. They generally had that day is what they were living on. They knew what they were going to eat today. Maybe if they were lucky, they knew what they were going to eat tomorrow. Meat was a luxury they really never got to enjoy because you just couldn't afford to kill an animal because it had value. And so that was just something that was a luxury that they never really got to experience. You know, we're so blessed in this country. We, we can go into our, between our pantry and our freezer, we can probably survive for weeks on the food that we have there. Now, it may be rice and crackers and beans, may not be pretty, but we can survive. Most of them didn't know what they were going to eat the next day. Now, some of them had little gardens, some of them had a couple of animals, but others had even less than that. But what amazed me about them and what caught my attention was not their lack of wealth. It was their generosity. It was their gratitude for the little things that they had. They had so much less than we do, and yet they were so generous with it. So one of the traditions in Uganda for Christian communities is if you go visit them, they give you a gift. And you can't refuse it because it's bad manners to refuse the gift. So every house we would go to, they would give us potatoes or something else out of the garden. Everywhere, it was something of value. I remember we went to this one house, and when we got ready to leave, I noticed that they had four chickens in the yard, and the, the man comes in as we were walking out, and he's got one of those chickens, and he gave it to us. Think about that. That's like you coming over for dinner at my house and me saying, thanks for coming by, just take a car. It's roughly the equivalent. They are so generous with what they have. They love one another, and they're, grat they're grateful for that. Another house we went to had this little bitty storage building that was just like the size of a little dog house. And I asked the man what that was for, and he said, oh, from our little garden, if we get a couple of days of extra food, we just put it in there so our neighbors can come by and they don't even have to ask to take food so that they can eat. They have so much less than we do, and yet they have so much more. They're happy and they're filled with peace. They don't worry about financial investments. They don't worry about 401ks or bank accounts. They don't stress about what they don't have. They're excited and grateful for what, for what they do, and they share it with one another because they know it all belongs to God anyway. When they understand that their stuff doesn't belong to them, it changes their perspective on the way they use it. 
See, it's not about how much you have. It's about what you do with what you have. And here is the depressing thing for us. Despite the fact that we have incredible wealth in this country, we're in the middle of a rising mental health crisis. Depression, anxiety, mental health disorders are skyrocketing. The Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, they monitor mental health as well as physical health. And one of the studies I looked at to see how they do that was a survey of high school students. They started doing it back in 2011, and the most recent data now is 2021. And they asked high school students a series of questions about their mental health. And the most recent data that came out in 2021 is is pretty shocking. 42% of high schoolers experience persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. It's almost half. That's a 50% increase from just 10 years ago. 23% of high school students have seriously considered attempting suicide. That's a 38% increase from 10 years ago. Think about that. How big a deal is that? That means that more than one in five teenagers, high schoolers, have seriously thought about taking their own life. That's just an indication of the problems that we have with mental health and psychological health in this country. We have another problem. We don't have enough mental health providers. We have a, a basic shortage of people to help with that. In this country, we now have a real problem with mental and psychological health. And a big question the church has got to answer over the next few years is how are we going to intersect that? How are we going to make a difference and be part of the solution? You know, someone asked me several weeks ago why our church doesn't preach more on psychological issues and mental health. And and I'm going to own this. It was one of the worst answers I've given to somebody in a long, long time. I said, you know, we, we actually do talk about this on occasion. I said, we'll, we'll preach on that. I said, in fact, last year we had a whole series we called uh, Mind Games where we talked about mental and psychological health. I, I said, but we don't talk more about it because the Bible really doesn't talk directly about it. I said, there, you know, there are mental health counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists. That's kind of their purview. And our purview as preachers is different. We preach about the gospel. That is the worst answer I could have given. It was absolutely wrong. Over the last few weeks, God has kicked me in the behind and told me that there is a huge intersection between the gospel message and mental health. And he's done it in a number of ways, and I'm going to tell you how he's done it. See, as we've been preaching about growing in discipleship, and I've been hearing stories of life change, of people that have really started praying with more passion and desperation, and studying God's word and living it out, and beginning to give in a generous way, and begin to serve one another differently than they've done before. I've seen changes, not just in their relationship with Jesus, but I've seen significant improvement in mental health and psychological health. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you heard the story of a 14-year-old student in our church, and you heard him talk a little bit about how over the last six months or so, he's really dived into God's Word, and he's really moved from decided to disciple. And that's cool in and of itself, but what you may not have picked up from the video is how that intersects with his mental health. Six months ago when he started this process, he was dealing with some serious depression. He was isolated. He wouldn't come out of his room much at all. His parents were worried about his mental health. He wouldn't engage with adults, wouldn't even engage with other kids. He would just hide. And if you saw him at church, which you probably didn't, he would sit right out uh, up on the little booth thing with his earbuds in, not talking to anybody. In the last six months, he's a different dude. He's not just now interacting with people. He's leading. Let me tell you some of the stuff that he's doing. He is talking to adults and kids. He is witnessing at school. He's inviting his friends and their parents to church. He preached a sermon a few weeks ago to some at-risk veterans. He's part of our prayer team, and he prays with and for adults. Last Sunday, before we start our first service, we have a prayer time where we all gather as a worship team and pastors, and he was the person that prayed completely different guy. But what we've also seen during that process is depression, pretty much gone. Isolation is gone. He is a different person. He is transformed, not just spiritually, but psychologically and mentally as well. And, And then last Sunday, I was talking to a lady in the lobby who said that before she really engaged here at Karis City and began serving on Sunday mornings and serving with our homeless ministry, that she had major anxiety issues that she was just angry and upset all the time, that her marriage was really struggling, that her family was being attacked and they were having issues. 
But she told me since she's engaged and began to move from decided to discipled, her anxiety is pretty much gone, that she has a different perspective, that her marriage is dramatically better, that her family is in a different place. And then the husband chimed in and said, being a part of what Kara City is doing has made a dramatic difference in their family. These mental health changes aren't coming from some new counseling strategy or some new medication that they're trying. This change is happening from the inside out as they move from decided to disciple. These are just a couple of examples, but I could give you a lot more. I've heard so many stories. I could tell you about other marriages that are way better than they have been. Parent-child relationships that have improved. People that are going through some really tough circumstances in their life that are still experiencing peace, joy, and hope, even some happiness along the way as they go through that. I could share all those, but then we'd eat dinner when we were done together and you'd never come back to church, so I'm not going to do that. But what we find is that the Bible talks a lot about peace, hope, and joy. And and isn't that what we need as, not just spiritually, but isn't it what we need psychologically? Peace and hope and joy. We know that having a spirit of gratitude really improves our mental health. It even improves physical health. If you are struggling with a disease like cancer and you're grateful, even in those circumstances, and you have a spirit of thankfulness, you're more likely to recover well than somebody that is not. And the Bible talks about having that gratitude, having a spirit of thankfulness that improves not just our spiritual health, but our physical and mental health. Look at one passage of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 18. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The Bible is telling us, God is telling us to do stuff that isn't just spiritually good for us, but but it's how we're wired. It makes us operate better mentally and physically. And and so getting ready for this sermon, I started then studying some, some different research studies, some papers and things about psychological effects and physical effects of generosity and how much it affects our physical and mental well-being, now competing with the rain for volume. I hope you hear me. And I want to share a few details about what I learned. The University of California at Berkeley published an article back in 2018 about the effects of when we're generous with our money, our time, and our effort. And if you don't know much about the UCLA Berkeley, you can know it is not a Christian university, right? But here's what they say in this article. Giving social support through time, effort, or goods is associated with better overall health in older adults. And volunteering is associated with delayed mortality. Other studies have shown a link between generosity and happiness. Now listen to this article from November of 2023, so just less than six months ago, called Is Generosity Good for Your Health from Columbia University Medical Center? Here's what it says. Generosity impacts our health and well-being in so many positive ways. It boosts mood, self-esteem, and our immune system. It also reduces stress, anxiety, and blood pressure. The associated feel-good chemicals can help reduce aches and pains and help us sleep better. How about this study that I looked at? This study found that generosity with resources can reduce blood pressure by as much as medication and exercise combined. How about that effect of what God's telling us to do? An article in Psychology Today discusses a study that was conducted by the University of Michigan. And it concludes that increased generosity leads to less worry and a longer life. Listen to this quote from the article. Generosity is no longer the selfless act we thought it to be. Studies now show that one of the biggest benefactors of generosity is the person who's dishing it out. It also references a study that found that stressful life events like uh, the death of a loved one or a loss of a job really affect the mortality rates of people who aren't generous. But for people that are generous, there was no effect on their mortality rate when a serious life event occurred. Let me say that a different way. If you're generous, you're less likely to die when things get tough. That's what that article is saying. Another article on WebMD from August 7th of 2023, so less than a year ago, refers to a clinical study that shows decreased inflammation in the bodies of people that are generous with their time. And then the same study shows that about half the deaths worldwide come from inflammation. Inflammation in our bodies leads to things like strokes, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Look, I could cite more. There's just study after study after study showing about the connection between generosity and our physical and mental well-being. If you stop and think about it, doesn't that make sense, though? I mean, if God made us and he wired us in a particular way, 
He knows what's best for us. And then Jesus sums this up with his statement 2,000 years ago, it is better to give than to receive. Look, I wish I could go back in time and answer that question again because I'd like a do-over in that moment where if I got to answer that same question about why we don't preach on mental health more, I would say with absolute confidence and the backing of scientific studies and scripture and my own observation, I would say when we preach on Sunday mornings, we preach on mental health every single week because the gospel is all about transformation. It is transforming us spiritually. It is transforming us physically and emotionally and psychologically. It is all about change. Moving from decided to discipled changes everything about you. Let me be clear about something, though, as we're going through this. I, I'm not saying that, that, that psychiatric medication and counseling don't play a big part in mental health. They do. And, and some of you guys are going to need that in addition to moving from decided to disciple. But, but here's what I am saying. Being a disciple of Jesus and living it out can be enough for some of you. And it can transform not just your spiritual condition, but your psychological and mental condition. The fundamentals of discipleship, when you put them into place in your life, will change your life. They, they can also bring you a new happiness that overcomes anxiety and depression. An online article from CNBC just two months ago talked about how generosity is one of the uh, easiest ways to, quote, get happy is what they call it. It looks at a couple of different studies, and the writer interviews a couple of different researchers, and he reports that generosity leads directly to increased happiness. And, and I love he gets a quote from the Cleveland Clinic, and here's the Cleveland Clinic is saying why this works, why generosity leads to increased happiness. And it says... It happens that way because we are wired for generosity. And I, and I read that and I stopped for a second because there's no mention of God. There's no mention of the Bible. But it says we are wired for generosity. Well, if we're wired, doesn't that mean somebody wired us? Isn't that how that works? If we're going to be wired, somebody wired, if a car's wired together, we're wired. God set us up. He created us for a particular purpose. So, Here's where that truth comes that we're wired for generosity. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote in the Bible 2,000 years ago in Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, we are hardwired for generosity with our time and our resources. Then I love another quote from that same CNBC article. Listen to this one. It's even better. We've always been told, give and you shall receive. It's really, really true now, more so than it ever has been before. Seems like I've heard that quote before. Seems like maybe that comes from, have y'all heard that quote? But I, I think it comes from Jesus in Luke 6, 38, when Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. Or as the New Living Translation translates that same passage of scripture, give and you will receive. I, I'm not going to say that those scientific studies confirm the Bible, because you cannot confirm the Bible. The Bible confirms itself. But what I will say is as we have become more advanced psych, uh, scientifically and medically, we're realizing that God told us the right thing 2,000 years ago, and we understand that. The Bible is in part an owner's manual to tell us how we work best. And, and so when we follow through on how we work best, we're going to have a, a more abundant life. The Bible tells us that will happen too. The Apostle Paul brings all this truth about generosity together in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 8. Listen to what he says. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God loves a cheerful giver. He, he loves that because it tells him that we've made that transition. We understand it's his anyway, so we're giving it back to him to use. But when we're generous and we're happy about generous, it transforms who we are, not just spiritually, but psychologically and physically. We're wired to be generous. And so when we live that out, we're transformed. Now, here's the practical part of generosity. You know, in past weeks I've said, hey, here's you know, five ways to try to share your faith. Here's three... There's not really five secrets to making giving easier. There's really not four tips to uh, giving your time without it feeling like it's a sacrifice. So my practical advice to you is dive in on generosity and see what God does.
Now, here's the hard part. Obedience for generosity usually comes before you get these different benefits that we're talking about, right? You, you have to first make the decision, I'm going to be generous, and I'm going to gladly give back to God and other people. And then through that process, you're transformed. And so that's how that works. But you've got to dive in. But we're going to give you lots of opportunities at this church to be generous with your time and also generous with your resources, with your time. We have partnerships where we have outreach to homeless individuals, at-risk veterans, and single moms. So I want to tell you, our next Suppers and Showers event is this Tuesday for the homeless. And this Tuesday, we're actually baptizing three individuals who've given their life to God. You can be part of that. You can watch this life change happen where we're not just providing food. We're loving on people who are hurting and watching as God changes their lives. And oh, by the way, as he changes their lives and you serve, he'll also change yours. You can dive into serving here at Karis City. You can serve on Sunday mornings. You can lead a community group or a Bible study. You can be generous with your money. You know, we talk pretty regularly about where our money goes here at Kara City because we want to be generous as a church. But I will tell you again that more than 20% of the overall giving that came into this church last year went right back out the door to mission organizations or to help people in need. We're being generous as a church so that people can be impacted by that. See, here's the difference between generosity back to God through the church and generosity through, let's just say, non-Christian organizations. Our master's primary goal, his primary mission for us is to draw people to him. And so when you give to the church, we're using that money not just to make people's circumstances better, but we're using that to introduce them to Jesus so that he can change their eternity. When you give to some other organization that doesn't have that purpose, they're just trying to make a temporary situation better. But in 150 years... None of that's going to matter. I, I want to share one last story with you. You guys may know Cynthia and Jesse Cade. They've been in our church for about a year. Um, I think they'll be here second service. You can hang out and meet them. But I want to tell you a little bit about their story. Met them about a year ago at uh, suppers and showers. They were living in a car in the Walmart parking lot. They were homeless. Her son had just died. He was who was taking care of them. And so they were grieving the loss of her son, but also suddenly lost an apartment and living in a car. And our church rallied around them. We began to give them food and money to help them. We helped get them into and paid for a long-term motel room. Then we helped them find and, and get into a government-subsidized apartment where they live today. And a year later, they are completely different. They are now, have gone from being worried about what we were going to do for them to they're all about serving other people. They bring me gifts almost every Sunday. They bring me something just to encourage me as their pastor, some little food item. Suppers and showers on Tuesday, they're making the dessert for that. They're, they're now serving the place where we met them. They are generous with people in their apartment complex. They pray with anybody who will listen. They invite them to this church because they love this church. Now, I knew that, but I learned something new a couple of weeks ago. They, they told me that when we first met them and they were living in the car, that they were openly discussing suicide, that they were ready to just together, you know, go out together because they had no hope, that they'd lost the will to live. But, but over the last year, that's gone. They, 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 they have joy. They have hope. They've become discipled. They've seen the love of God's people. Look, I'm not saying they don't have difficult days. They do. But that depression is gone and it's been replaced by different feelings. They, they've gone from wanting to be served to being desperate to serve other people. And, and I'm just blown away by the impact of what that's done, not just spiritually on them, but psychologically. They've gone from being so depressed that they were ready to end it all to being a blessing to other people. So see, they, they became disciples. And, and along the way, they found hope and peace and joy. And when that happens, it changes everything. Let's pray.